Falling Walls Science Breakthrough of the Year 2022 in Social Sciences and Humanities. Breaking the Wall to Environmental Justice. How migration histories give us a deeper understanding of climate change. Sunil Amrith, Yale University. On November 9th, 1989, I was 10. The Falling Wall is the first world event I was really conscious of. What would it take to make you leave your homes? I hope none of you ever have to confront this but imagine that because of a flood or fire or unbreathable air or poisoned ground, you had to abandon everything. Where would you go? You're wondering about the red and white cards on your seats. Now all is revealed. I'd like to do a little crowd survey. If you think you would go somewhere to a region or a country where you speak the language, then in a moment, I'm going to ask you to hold up the red cards. If you think you would go somewhere you don't speak the language, or you don't have that cultural connection, then in just a moment, I shall ask you to hold up the white card. Let's do the survey. Please hold up the cards. The UN's International Organization of Migration predicts that between now and 2050, one and a half billion people around the world will be displaced by the effects of climate change. And here in the Global North, we hear a lot about climate migrants, climate refugees, and the way in which they are discussed is very often alarmist. Just think of the language, the watery language. We talk about floods of migrants, waves of migration. They're at the gates waiting to be let into the wealthiest countries in the world. Except they won't be. Most people in the world will make exactly the same choices as the people in this room, and particularly the majority of you who held up the red cards. Most people will go where they have family, attachments, networks of support, cultural familiarity. We cannot grapple with environmental justice without thinking about migration. And we cannot understand migration without grappling with the legacies of history. And for most people in the global south, that means grappling with the legacies of empires and their aftermath. I have been a migrant many times. I come from a South Indian family. I was born in Kenya. I grew up in Singapore. I studied and worked in the United Kingdom. I live and work in the US. I have moved through the world, like many people in this room, from a position of great privilege. I've chosen to move, to seek education and opportunities. But even my privilege journeys have been shaped by history. I realized, for example, that I've never lived anywhere that wasn't at one point part of the British Empire. And I think and write and dream in English. Ecologists tell us we are living in the midst of a universal redistribution of life on Earth. Not only human beings, but many forms of life are seeking higher elevations and higher latitudes. A world on the move at the rate, on one estimate, of 115 centimeters every year. Environmental history, my field of research, has as its task to remind us all that the distribution of life that is now unraveling before our eyes is not random. Look at this chart from the Oxford project, Our World in Data. This provides one big story of the distribution of life on Earth. This is a chart of global cropland since about 1600. Consider all of the histories in this one chart. This is a history of more and more human life being sustained on this planet in greater security, and it is a history of enduring hunger. This is a history of people moving in search of land and freedom, 
and it is a history of enslavement and dispossession. The redistribution of life that we are living in the midst of carries the scars and amplifies the inequalities of earlier redistributions. And there are two walls in particular that history has bequeathed us when it comes to environmental justice. The first you all know very well, and that is the inverse relationship between vulnerability to the effects of climate change and responsibility for causing it. Second, though, is a fundamental inequality of mobility. Not everyone can move, and not everyone can move freely. We grapple with the material legacies of history, but also with very powerful habits of thought, which the humanities have many tools to help us understand. Once upon a time, the most powerful people in the world thought, and maybe some still do, that human beings and the rest of nature were but resources to be exploited and redistributed at will. The Bengali poet Rabindranath Tagore, India's first Nobel laureate, put it this way, and he was writing in the middle of the First World War. He said, turn a tree into a log, and it will burn for you, but it will never bear living flowers and fruit. And Tagore saw immediately the relationship between environmental destruction and human exploitation, because he went on to say that he lamented a condition of humanity where people had become so many fragments of a machine for the production of wealth on a gigantic scale. How far have we really moved from that view of the world? The most intensive periods of ecological harm have gone hand in glove with the most intensive exploitation of some people by others, very often migrant workers. A few months ago, I was at the archives of the Singapore Botanical Gardens. This is a place I've loved since I was a child. Many of you might have been there. It's a World Heritage Site. A hundred years ago, it was at the center of the British Empire's deliberate effort to redistribute life on Earth. It was the center of a network of plants. And here, from the archives, a handwritten document that historians like me love, is an entry of every single plant and plant specimen that arrived in the gardens in a particular month. They came from everywhere. They came from India, Indonesia, Australia, South Africa, Argentina. But perhaps the most fateful arrival was the arrival of wild rubber seeds from Brazil. They were cultivated in the garden, they thrived there, and within a very short time, Malaysia became the largest rubber producer in the world. On the left of the picture, you see the hero, Henry Ridley. He was director of the Botanic Gardens. He's credited with Malaysia's rubber boom. On the right, you see what is usually forgotten, which is that the cultivation of rubber in Malaysia depended on the intensive exploitation of, in this case, Indian migrant workers. Many of them there, not by choice, but under compulsion. Even in those most brutal of conditions, workers made a home of a kind. This is a small shrine on the rubber plantations, which you see all over Malaysia. Undoing this world of imperial exploitation sustained and inspired some of the most important struggles for justice and equality in the 20th century. Many walls fell. But the revolution of decolonization left many struggles unfinished. I need hardly remind you in this room that struggles for gender equality, racial equality, caste equality are very far from over. The revolution of decolonization also left two features of the world untouched. The first was the perspective that Tagore had lamented, the idea that saw human beings as separate from the rest of nature. Despite the criticisms of many indigenous groups, very few post-colonial nations moved away from the view that human beings were separate from nature and that nature was a resource to be exploited. Very few of the promises of rights and justice and growth took any cognizance of what Johann Rockström calls planetary boundaries. And worst of all, there remained the idea that some people, like some landscapes, 
could be sacrificed. Witness the 40 million people in India alone, most of them Adivasis, who have been displaced by the construction of large dams since 1947 alone. The second feature that the unraveling of empires left in place was a fundamental inequality in mobility, a documentary regime that decreed who could go where in this world. You see a straight line in this image from the left to the right. On the left is a document fixing the identity of an indentured laborer in Fiji in the 19th century. On the bottom right, you see a recent and failed scheme by the Indian government to issue two different kinds of passports, orange or blue, depending on the socioeconomic class and the educational level of their holders. Only recently, only once in a while in the course of the 20th century, were more creative efforts made, like with the famous Nansen passports on the top right used in Europe after the First World War, to think more flexibly about who could go where and under what conditions. These are the historical walls to environmental justice. Where do we go next? I believe that the legacies of history must be taken into account in designing policies and reimagining institutions. If we are going to talk about climate reparations, for example, as I believe we must, the nation state may not always be the scale on which justice is best served. Many of the most vulnerable people in the world to the effects of climate change are excluded and marginalized, denied citizenship, or forced into dispersion in their own countries. Very often, as one of the messy legacies of empire and its aftermath. This map shows what the IPCC has also stated unequivocally, which is that the vast majority of people displaced by climate change will move within their own countries. If they cross a border, it is likely to be within contiguous regions of the global south. And so it is urgent to understand the historical inequalities that continue to shape and constrain people's journeys. And one thing that history teaches us is that internal inequalities of today do not always have internal causes. Many of them are rooted in global processes of accumulation and inequality. Second, forced mobility and forced immobility can both be threats to the safety and viability of communities around the world. Historical experience suggests that people are at least as likely to be stuck, unable to move, as they are to move in large numbers through the coming climate crisis. My work in coastal South India over 15 years made me realize just how complicated is the decision to stay or to go. These choices are not always choices. People go where their personal and familial and regional and national histories allow them to go. And people stay because they're too ill or too poor to move, or they stay because they are attached to their landscapes, to their families, to their occupations, to their homes. They stay because for many people around the world, as the British Somali poet Warsan Shire puts it, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. Look again at the cards in your hands. And maybe think of them as repositories of the many histories that shape all of our choices. People sometimes say to me, the climate crisis is too urgent. We can't afford to look back. We must move on. To the contrary, the climate crisis is too urgent not to confront the histories that have brought us here and that keep us stuck. Thank you very much.